my sunglasses. You can see that. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Seitz Gruel. I am the Chief Advancement Officer at the, the Wikimedia Foundation. And I am your moderator today for a fireside chat with Mariana Iskander, our CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, and Selena Duckelman, who's our Chief Product and Technology Officer. Can we have the slides, please? Oh, look at this. It's a fireside chat. I don't know whose idea it was to have a fireside chat in Singapore in August, but is there any objections to changing this perhaps to a poolside chat? Just feels a little, little better? Okay, good, good, good. I wish we had some umbrella drinks up here to be sipping, but uh, we do have water. Um, so how this is gonna work, I've got a few questions for Mariana and Selena that have been submitted, but we're also gonna be taking questions from, from all of you. Uh, there's people walking around with cards. They'll be collecting those. Perhaps as you came in, someone had handed you a card. And there's, we also have mics that we'll be passing around uh, if you are somebody who wants to ask your question in purpose in, in person in this really big room. So uh, why don't we just with that get started? Mariana, my first question is for you. You've been here for about a year and a half. We're still counting, I guess, in, in months, 18 months. Yeah, I think once you hit two, you know, you no longer count in months. So you're, get, you're getting up there. Unless we're counting in dog years, then That's it's right. been much longer. That's right. So can you just tell us what your priorities have been and, uh, and how you've been working on achieving them in this, this kind of first session or first period of your leadership Aww. of the foundation? Well, first, just to say thanks to those of you who've chosen to spend some time with us. We're going to try to keep our, our answers brief so that we have time for questions and to hear from all of you. Um, I officially started at the Wikimedia Foundation in January of 2022. And because I knew that there was going to be a lot to do at the foundation once I started, I actually uh, wanted to prioritize starting my learning about our communities and our movement, and so had an opportunity between October and December of uh, 2021 to engage in a listening tour that involved meeting uh, volunteers and staff, members of our board, some of our external partners, um, so that when I started, I had a bit more context for the moment that the foundation was in and some of the issues that were on people's minds. And so that listening tour really um, was probably the important pre-boarding that started uh, before I joined. I really focused on uh, three things, our leadership, our strategy and planning, and then our culture uh, as an organization and our values. There had been some transition in the executive leadership uh, in the year before that I, I arrived and the um, chief technology officer and the chief product officer were open positions. And so really the highest priority, given that that is a, a significant part of the foundation's job, was to really ensure that we brought on the right leader. And at that point, um, having studied a bit of history, that it also felt like it was the right time to bring those two teams back together. And so I would say probably the most important contribution in that category was hiring Selena. She'll tell you more about herself um, uh, and, and joined about six months in. That also involved getting the benefit of um, our leadership team who have had a lot of experience in the movement. Lisa, who's uh, I think employee number three in terms of tenure and has been with the organization um, 13 years, 13 years. And so really ensuring that we were getting the best of people who could provide context and history and institutional memory and change uh, as well. And we've now had an opportunity to really build out that team through both external hires and internal promotions. Um, and so focusing a lot on the leadership of the organization. I would say that strategy and planning is the place we've really tried to reach out again to volunteers and communities doing that um, through 
a couple of ways. One, increasing the number of languages um, in which we communicate. So we've gone from six to 31 languages that the foundation does interpretation or translations and really inviting community feedback and also focusing on multi-year issues. Most of the challenges that we have and we'll talk about really can't be solved in a 12 month period. And so an opportunity to work with other um, uh, both movement entities, including the Movement Charter Drafting Committee. I know some of you are here today. And then the last thing, which I'll just say briefly, is that it's been my experience that when you have the best strategy in the world, but the culture can't accept it, it's very hard to make progress. And so to really also do work on thinking about our values and the culture of the organization, how we hold ourselves accountable, how we want to show up, how we want to engage. And so that's also been really important. Oh, thank you, Mariana. Selena, this is also your first Wikimania. It and is. you come to us from Mozilla. That's right. So, yes, this is my uh, third 20-year-old code base that I've worked on. PostgreSQL, Firefox, and now MediaWiki. Well, given that you've inherited a 30-year-old code base, uh, how do you make decisions around product and tech work that the teams will take on? Yeah, thanks for this question. Well, um, first of all, also, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk to everybody here today. It's really exciting to be at my first Wikimania. Um, and I'm in my, you know, this is, this is my first year. It's one year and I think 16 days um, that I've been here. So um, I'm still, you know, I'm now in my second year of onboarding and still kind of learning with you all. But it, I, I think, you know, I recently, uh, I guess not that recently now, but back in March um, and April, I published, uh, you know, the results of the listening tour that I undertook just following in Mariana's footsteps, really trying to learn from the community, the staff, um, as much as I could before we started figuring out um, what the big problems and uh, decisions that we needed to make in the product and technology space were. And the priority areas that I had there, um, you know, they, first of all, you know, helping solve problems for the volunteers, figuring out like our maintenance uh, situation and backlogs, and finally like helping the organization and the volunteers figure out decision making together. Those, those are the priorities that I have. And in terms of the specifics of the decision making um, and how we go about that, uh, you know, the center of it has to be, you know, what are the problems that we're trying to solve together and really what are the user needs? And we have a number of different ways that we get input on that. You know, some of them are, um, you know, very technical ways, you know, users will file bugs or community members will like let us know about features that they want to have through something like Fabricator. Uh, we also um, have a user research and a quantitative research team that go out and they seek data or they'll interview folks and put together reports that inform uh, how we take next steps with, with product ideas. Um, and this year, as part of the annual plan, we also put together uh, draft objectives all the way back in February, and we published those on Wiki to have like a really early conversation about, you know, is, is this directionally what we should be doing? Can we get feedback and input? And through that process, we actually changed, you know, what, what we were doing, and we went through several iterations of that. So, so that, that's the kind of decision-making processes that, that I think you know, the department should, um, should go with. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, been a really, uh, it's been a really great uh, process so far, just like learning with the community. And now we'll see like over the course of this year, like what we're able to accomplish together. That's exciting. Now I know there's one topic that just kind of is in the news and it's kind of on everybody's mind and that's AI. Can you share uh, just some of your thoughts? Do, does generative AI pose a threat to, to Wikipedia? Um, well, if any of you were in the session today, we had a couple really you know, fascinating and, and engaging sessions about AI um, and our movement today. And I, I think that um, there, there's definitely like a, a, you know, a challenge, you know, with generative AI. And I think, you know, any, I think it's quite evident that a system that can generate lots and lots of text 
um, that, you know, that has potentially hallucinations, misinformation embedded in it, um, and the speed at which that can be produced. You know, that, that's clearly like a, an issue on the internet today. Um, I think within the, um, you know, Wikimedia projects and Wikipedia specifically, those communities have come up with these incredibly robust systems for generating trustworthy information and knowledge and sharing that with the world. And I think that those, all those systems, they still work. <laughs> um, you know, is, is there, you know, a series of challenges that we're going to have to face together? Absolutely. But I also think there's a ton of opportunity in this space. You know, the, the acceleration of these models, they, um, uh, they've given us the opportunity to offer translations in more languages than any other major, um, you know, in, uh, website in the world, you know, uh, so software platform in the world. And I think that, um, you know, in the future, you know, and even now, you know, we have models that help find uh, vandalism and, you know, and help support editors in their work. And I think in the future, we're going to find more uses for the technology, you know, so, so I, I really see that there's like quite a bit of opportunity right now. Yeah, so less of a threat, particularly as we move, kind of work out the kinks of a new technology and a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I think so. And I just also say, like using machine learning isn't like a new thing for the movement or the foundation. We've had a machine learning team at the foundation since 2017. Um, and, you know, we keep investing, keep learning more. And yeah, I, I, think that, I think that there's just a lot of opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Selena. And Mariana, what external trends are, are you seeing right now? I mean, I think that um, there's a lot to be worried about in the world in general. I think we are seeing the general rise of authoritarian governments and censorship. We're seeing that technology is disrupting so many parts of human life in some ways not so great. And I think that um, similar to what I referenced briefly in the opening ceremony, I think that's why the work of Wikimedia actually feels more relevant and more urgent and more needed now than ever before. We have, I think, work to do to respond to what the world needs from us now. I think that the foundation has tried to reach out and ask for input on what are the key trends and the key threats we all have to be watching together. And those have really been about the changing nature of search. I have two nephews. They do not Google things. That is not how they search for information on the internet. And so how do we think about that? in terms of the, the habits of more and more users. We have to worry about how our content is disintermediated and used by others. We have to worry about our regulatory environment and what we're seeing really in many different regions of the world. The EU, the Section 230 regulations in the United States, things that are happening uh, in this region as well. I feel optimistic that those are, um, we had I think good consensus, those are the right things to be paying attention to and the right things to be watching together. And so the things we can control, which is how we respond, I think is gonna be the work ahead for all of us. Yeah, that makes a lot of, lot of sense. We are here uh, in, in Singapore, in a, a region of the world that it's been a while since we've been here for Wikimania. Um, it has been just amazing to see uh, all of the, the work of, of, of the volunteers in this region. Uh, what excites you most about what you're seeing in ECOP? Again, I feel like I've really tried to learn the ethos of the Wikimedia movement and the things that have come before that are really worth holding on to. And one of the things that is exhibited even in this Wikimania is to really put like you know, function and then form, like what are we trying to do? What is the thing that needs to be accomplished? And then let's figure out what the best structures are to be able to do that. And so typically, Wikimanias are hosted because there's a local chapter and they host it. And this region said, no, we're gonna make a plan to do this differently because we wanna bring Wikimania to Singapore. There is not a local chapter that can host, but we're gonna pull it together and we're just gonna like, again, bring the collective ingenuity of everybody and what they have to bring to the table. 
and I haven't been to another one, so I can't compare, but based on what I've heard just asking people the last few days really demonstrate that that kind of thinking can produce incredible results. Yeah, it's kind of a region of doers. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I, I traveled to Asia as a part of this job was probably 10 years ago. And you know, I, I had the experience of, of just trying to load Wikipedia on my phone, and it, it took forever just to load the page. But um, we're here in Singapore where there's actually now a caching center kind of right down the road. Um, and now it loads lightning fast. So my, my question for you, Selena, is, is what's your plan for uh, growing servers and caching centers around the world? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so yeah, it's very, very exciting that, that we have the caching center here and it had a profound impact on page, loads, page load times in the region. So the Wikimedia Foundation, um, unlike a lot of organizations, whether they're nonprofits or for profits, we actually operate our own data centers for a number of reasons, but one of them is user privacy. You know, so we um, operate our own content delivery networks, uh, and that enables us to have like a lot of control over um, how information is stored and transmitted. You know, uh, between these different data centers that we operate, one of which is in Singapore. Um, we have uh, another in Marseille, and that. Uh, data center was was put there because we we also have another one in Amsterdam But the reason why we put one in Marseille was because its location enabled us to have much faster access time in con in the continent of Africa so um, each place that we choose it's based on data that we have about how fast pages load all around the world and the next place that we're targeting is um, in the global south um, it's South America and what we're doing there, like the criteria that we have for that, um, it's in part, you know, the page load times, like where, where can we place it so that we'll speed up those page load times. It has to be in close proximity to, um, you know, a point of presence, like where, you know, there's a major, for example, like fiber optic, you know, network connection um, that, you know, connects uh, high speed networks like across a region. Um, and also, you know, it needs to be in a place where, you know, we can uphold our values, like as an organization. So we're in the process of evaluating that right now, and I'm hoping, you know, just in the next few months, we'll be able to announce, like, the specific location. But I'm really excited about that, you know, and our effect that it'll have um, in that region. Well, that is amazing. I'm sure folks in Latin America are excited about that. Um, so that is it for kind of the prepared questions that were given in advance. We are now going to open it up to any of you. Um, you can hand, if you have a card, you can hand it to Nadie over here. Guillaume is collecting cards. We also have microphones. Uh, Margot can take your cards. We also have microphones if you want to ask questions live, if you're brave and want to talk in this really big room. In, any of that works. All right, here comes Nadie with some burning questions. All right, thank you. Okay, Mariana, I think I'm gonna give this one to you. What do you have to say about the Global Council? I'm not gonna treat that as a trick question. <laughs> um, so my first conversations about a global council started before I started this job, because um, when I was getting to know volunteers in uh, different parts of the world, I remember a conversation uh, with somebody who actually was at, uh, based in Europe, and they said, what's your position on the global council? I, at that point, did not know actually um, an, enough to give an informed answer. I think to the extent that the Global Council represents the idea of how do we ask the best placed entities in our movement to do the right things, everybody's for that. And I certainly think that that's the right conversation for us to be having. I'm mindful that the Movement Charter Drafting Committee hasn't yet produced a document um, on all of the different chapters that it's been working on, and probably folks in the room have had varying levels of engagement with that. Um, but I guess all I would say 
in response to the earlier point that you made about ESEAP is that I think this movement has demonstrated the ability to create any structure that it wants, and that is something that we're good at. It's just about making sure that we're all aligned on who's doing what and so that they can do it well. Yeah, and, and how would you see kind of the, the Wikimedia Foundation uh, working with the Global Council? Well, so one of the things, again, I'm mindful not everybody's on the mailing list, not everybody reads everything, so I don't want to make any assumptions, but one of the reasons that the Wikimedia Foundation has tried to identify really important topics for multi-year planning is, as I said, some things are really important and need to, to have a long view. And one of the topics that we've identified is really around core responsibilities, which is what should the foundation do and what should the foundation not do? What should others do? How can we partner? How can we support? How can we resource? And so for me, I hope that that is um, like a very visible signal that we're open. We're open to having the right conversations about who's best placed to do the things that need to get done and ensure that everybody has both the support and the resources that they need. Thank you. All right, Selena, I think this next one is probably for you. It's about the te technology wish list. Um, and this has been a, a place where volunteers express kind of their desires for what, what they would like to be built. And um, is there, is there a, a plan on taking it off, off hold? Um, what, what are we thinking for the wish list in the future? Yeah, great question. Um, so the the wish list, um, the wish list has some challenges. Um, one of the challenges that volunteers have expressed is that um, it's a very, very long list, and only a very small handful of those wishes are um, granted, you know, on on a yearly basis. So, um, what what can we do about that? Um, you know, and I've over the last, you know, six, eight months been um, learning a lot about the process that, and all of the effort that goes into creating the wish list. Um, and I've also been learning from the uh, community tech team and thinking about, you know, what, what would be the best path forward uh, for, for the list. So there's a team right now that's like thinking about this and, and basically the, the, what we've, come to the conclusion, you know, our conclusion that we've come to is that the wish list is bigger than just like one, you know, very small team. And really the kinds of things that people are, um, that volunteers are raising in the wish list should be things that come to all of the product and tech teams at the foundation. So that's the path that we're on right now, trying to determine like how can we best like take these great ideas these, you know, um, requests for help, you know, maintenance um, issues that are being raised, and really just get those to the teams that can best work on them, and you know, think about it not as just like a one-time thing. So there's a session um, that's happening this week that the uh, Comtech team and, and several members of the Comtech team are here this week. If you want to talk to any of them about that, but I think that you know that that's the step that we're taking here at uh, Wikimania, and then you'll be hearing more from that team, like relatively soon in the next couple months. Oh, thank you. Okay, Mariana, I think maybe this is for you. I, th I suspect this comes from somebody from Queens, New York. We won't try to identify you, but uh, when will the office be moved from expensive San Francisco to a cheaper place? For example, Queens, New York. Um, having been to Queens, I'm very happy to have an office there. So. Again, maybe just as context, the foundation uh, is a, essentially a remote first organization. We have staff that are split about half within the United States and about half of the staff actually that live outside of the United States. For a lot of historical reasons, we have had um, a physical office in San Francisco. Prior to the pandemic, uh, there were several teams that were located in San Francisco. I don't have to tell this audience how much uh, the COVID-19 pandemic changed all of our lives and our ways of working. And so we've been as an organization also coming to terms with some of those shifts in terms of how people understand where they work and how they work. We've been very open with our staff that the current lease in our San Francisco office 
um, comes up uh, for either expiration or renewal at the end of 2024. And I think that is going to be the right time to have an organizational conversation about what makes sense, how do we want to use our resources, do we want to invest in giving people an opportunity to gather more, do we need to keep a space for legal reasons, which we may need to do, and so to really give ourselves between now and the end of next year to have the right conversation. But we have a lot of staff in New York and in Queens, and they gather very regularly, and so we definitely do not need an office to be able to hang out in Queens. Yeah. Wikimania in Queens sometime? I mean, yeah, okay. Thankfully, oh, that's not my decision. That's not, not our decision. I love Queens too. Uh, well, I'm gonna just pause for a second to see if we have any, uh, before I get back to the cards, to see if we have any uh, folks who want to ask their question in, in person. Do we have anybody who wants, uh, wants to take the mic? No? Okay, I guess, I guess we'll go back to the cards. Um, so I'm gonna ask this to both of you, and, and you're gonna need to actually do this. So close your eyes. The card says if you close your eyes, but I'm just gonna make them close their eyes. Okay. <laughs> What would the perfect slash ideal future of, of open knowledge look like? You got it? You got it? Okay, you can open your eyes now. You go first. <laughs> oh <my laughs> That's fine. Um, so when I closed my eyes, it was very peaceful. First of all, I was envisioning that, uh, that beach scene. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I, think, I think a perfect future for open knowledge would be one um, without censorship. Um, it would be one where everyone that wanted to would be able to freely contribute without fear. It would be amazing. And, um, and I think there would be uh, all the bugs in MediaWiki would be fixed. All bugs in MediaWiki would be fixed. That would be incredible. I mean, first of all, it's very bright up here. So when you close your eyes, it's still very bright. But, um, you know, I think that the future would look like us achieving many of the things that have been identified in our movement strategy. Imagining a world where the things that we worry about, you know, in terms of people's access to information, no matter where they live, an opportunity for people that feel like what they're reading online is accurate and can be trusted and is verified in a way that they can find it for themselves. I definitely feel like the idea of um, knowledge production being something that more and more people can be a part of. It sounds a little bit like maybe a, a dream that's not possible, but again, I think if you look back 20 years ago, I don't think people would have thought that what Wikipedia has become was possible either. And so I think there is a track record to dream about things that seem impossible. Very good answer. Okay, this next one, I'm gonna broaden this question a little bit, but, and this, is, this question is about kind of what inspires us. Are there other things in the world that, um, that, that perhaps, you know, Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation could take inspiration from. Now the question specifically mentions Encarta, but I'm gonna broaden it a little bit and just think about what in the world perhaps we in this movement could, could take inspiration from, perhaps other open source projects and why, is there any inspiration from Mozilla that maybe we should be bringing in? Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the first thing. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's lots of lessons that I brought with me from, from Mozilla that, that um, we could take inspiration from. But the first thing that popped into my mind, actually, when you said that, um, was a volunteer organization that um, I participated in and was a, a volunteer leader for. It's this organization called Hands On. And um, what inspires me about their mission and, and what they do, it's, it's aligned a lot with ours, which is that just really encouraging volunteers to come and in their, each in their own individual way to contribute as much 
you know, as they can, whenever they can. Um, and I think the parts of that, that their mission and what they do that I would love to um, just have more of that spirit here. We already have this like great individualistic um, support network, you know, and, and volunteer um, engagement. But I think what hands-on does is it, it creates these, uh, these moments where the volunteers come together and they make meaning out of the work that they're doing together and they talk with each other, kind of like what we're doing here at Wikimania actually, um, but they do it all the time. And that, that's kind of something that I take inspiration from that I, I feel helps us grow and sustain the volunteers um, over a very long period of time. So, so that's, that's one of the things that I, yeah, that I take inspiration from. Can I ask you the same question, Mariana? Is there something in the, I mean, and you have a, a really interesting background with your, you came to us, you know, having led a, a, a nonprofit organization on the African continent for a decade. Is there, you know, perhaps something from your, your, your previous work that inspires you now here at the Wikimedia Foundation? I mean, I think that the reality is that, um, the world of Wikimedia is so global in nature, like all of the challenges in the world in some ways replicate themselves in our world, which just makes everything on the table. And I think when that's the case, how do you decide how to prioritize? How do you decide how to move forward? And I would say the two things that really have given me inspiration that feel um, relevant to, to now, when you're trying to do things that haven't been done before, there isn't a playbook or a rule book. And so how do you decide together what to do. Because if it's something that's already been done, it's pretty straightforward. There's like a manual, there's a guide, you just sort of do it. And I think that that's why in-person gatherings like this are so important because often it is true that you move at the speed of people and organizations trusting each other. And so what does it take to build that by, I hope, building relationships, being accountable, you know, doing the things that you say you're gonna do. And so I feel like I've learned certainly from um, that work. The second thing which was true, I mean, youth unemployment on the African continent is like, I, in my opinion, the seminal issue for an entire continent. And we're gonna have a generation of young people who really are not participants in the society. And there's, there's a lot there to worry about. But everybody has a different approach in a different way. And sometimes figuring out if we're disagreeing about why, or are we disagreeing about what, or are we disagreeing about how? And I have found that to be really helpful because oftentimes we're not disagreeing about why, we're not really disagreeing about what, but we're disagreeing about how, and that's a different kind of conversation than, than the others. And so I think for me, that's been a really important lesson to bring into this. I'll just deal with that one. Okay. Oh, good, we got some more questions here. So this is, this is a, a question that, regarding an issue that's kind of before your time, but I think, I think you, you know about it. Can you comment on the office action regarding Chinese Wikipedia in, in 2021? So I've, if the person in this room asks this question, I'm gonna give an honest answer because I really don't comment on office actions like from a stage, but it's a conversation I'd be willing to, to have. And I just wanna point out that Stephen Laporte, maybe Stephen can raise his hand or stand up, is sitting here in the front row and I think we'll be able to also provide answers to questions or have a discussion about that as well. Okay. So the next, the next question, um, these are both kind of kind of around budgets. Um, you know, th this year the, the foundation reduced some of its staff. Should the affiliates expect to have to do the same in the future? I don't think that the foundation's decision to reduce its staff has any relationship to how affiliates want to resource themselves or staff themselves. I think what we tried to do, and it's all on meta, and I think well documented in the annual plan, is to really um, look ahead and try to have multi-year projections that gave us a sense of what was needed over the course of a three to five year period and ensure that we were growing sustainably to be able to be responsible and also making decisions again that could last over multiple years and took the decision after looking at a number of areas um, to be able to ensure that the foundation's kind of spending path was gonna get there. I don't think that that relates to affiliate staff and their resourcing and their staffing in any way. And then this is kind of related. 
how much more money does the foundation need before it has enough? I guess that depends enough to do what, right? Yeah, I mean, you should also answer that. Sure. So again, that's exactly right, is I think if we start with what we need to achieve, we can work backwards to what resourcing is needed to be able to do that. And again, resources are money, but resources are time and resources are a lot of other things as well. And so I, I feel like we have a community with a lot of needs. And in fact, I think, you know, one of the criticisms is the foundation can't meet all of those needs. And so does that require more resources for the movement? Then let's have that conversation. I think what often gets in the way is that we might disagree about how we distribute resources, which is very different than agreeing we either need more or we want to achieve more together or different regions of the world have different aspirations and so they should be unleashed to achieve those aspirations. But you've been at this a lot longer than me, so what's your answer? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, I don't think about it just in terms of kind of what, what the needs are today, but what the needs are gonna be in the future as, as well. Um, you know, I, the, the, the primary question, right, is, is do we think we're, we're on a path with, with kind of our, our, our revenue models that we're gonna have a secure future. Not just can we, you know, fund the needs that we need to today. Um, and, you know, and then I would say beyond that, are we spending every resource, uh, you know, to, to, to its full potential, right? Are we putting it all to, to good use? And this past year, that's really what I've seen, kind of the focus at the foundation. It really wasn't about growth. In fact, we, we kind of cut back in some areas and it was making sure that every dollar was spent to the biggest impact that we, we could provide. Um, and I also hear, you know, it just people come up to me in, in conferences like this, always with lots of fresh ideas, things that they want funding for. So I, I, I think that, I think there's, there's a lot of energy in this movement there's a lot of, of things that people want to do that sometimes require, require resources, require um, investment. And so I don't, I don't think we are, are at a point where we don't know what to do. I think it's, we're at a point where we've had really rapid growth and we need to just focus on making sure that we're putting those resources to the best possible use and spending every donor dollar as well as we can. Well, okay, this, this is quite a question. Um, okay, can you, I mean, I guess, I don't know if this question should be to me or you or who this question is to, but I'll just read it and perhaps, perhaps this will be a question to the audience. Can you please scream, Wikimedia loves free and open source and privacy? Can you do that? Again, Wikimedia loves free and open source and privacy. Yes, thank okay. you. Yes. All right, you're gonna give us a countdown and... Okay, we're gonna count, uh, do you have that? It's a, it's, it's a mouthful. It's gonna be really jumbled. Okay, ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Wikimedia, Wikimedia loves free and open source and privacy. Okay. Yay. So, yeah, we did that. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have. Unless uh, I'll give one last opportunity for someone, a brave soul, to ask with the microphone. Do we have any? Oh, any? Right oh, 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 oh. I see some, some people. This is, this is good. Okay. I've got two alternative questions for both of you. The first one is, what's currently the biggest elephant in the room? The second one is, what is the piece of puzzle you're currently missing in your work? What, is just the second one? What, what is the piece of puzzle that you are currently missing yeah. in your work? Well, I mean, I cracked a joke that this room is so big, it might have enough space for all of the elephants. And again, I think what's hard is some of you maybe have been in the Wikimedia movement for a long time, and so you know what a lot of the historic debates are, and then there's brand new people, and they're like, what are all these people talking about? I actually have no idea what anybody's talking about. So again, I'll do my best maybe to cover both, you know, both of those. I think 
I worry the most about what's happening in the world because, again, I think that we're here to deliver on this like impossible mission that requires things that have never been done before. And we have to keep asking ourselves, are we doing what we need to respond to the world and the needs of the world? So the trends that I talked about, you know, I think really drive a lot of the things that I worry a lot about. I think the question of how do we work as a movement you know, I think I'm learning what some of those elephants are. And having also come from another volunteer-led movement, many of these issues are familiar, right? People have a lot of views on who should do what. People have a lot of views on how should resources be allocated and used and spent. So in some ways, I'm comforted that those are not unfamiliar challenges. They're ones that have to get worked through in, in the Wikimedia way and kind of what the answers are for us. But when I, because I do, I get information about threats to our volunteers in different parts of the world. That's the stuff that's, that's, the stuff that's scary. And trying to, to figure out how do we ensure that our product and technology can keep up and that we can respond and that we can do those. So I think that if you piled up the elephants, in, you know, we'd be able to sort of figure it out. I think the second on the puzzle, and again, maybe just as context, uh, because I really don't expect everybody to read all the emails I send, but if you go look, there is an email that I sent in 2022. I think um, I had named five puzzles. One was about what the world needs from us. The second was about how do we think about contributions? Is it just about edit count or are there, are there other ways of understanding the contributions of volunteers? The third had to do with how do we harness this multilingualism? Like Selena said, it's incredible to have projects in 332 languages and counting. And I'm mindful a lot of these spaces are in English, which is biased for a lot of reasons, even in ECF. And so trying to think about multilingualism. And the fourth had to do with product and tech and the work that we have to do. The fifth puzzle nobody remembers, but it's the piece that I'm missing. And so I want to answer your question, which is the reality is that how you run an organization, meaning like an entity with staff, is sometimes different than how we run our projects. And there's been just historic tension because sometimes things work for projects, they don't work for organizations. Sometimes things work for organizations, they don't work for projects. And so really trying to figure out that missing puzzle piece of how organizations and projects can actually support each other, not feel in tension with each other is probably the thing I feel like I'm missing. And I'm open, if anybody has any ideas, I'm all ears. Yeah, so, um, I'm going to answer a little bit more narrowly because right now what I'd say my, my focus is, is very much in like the operations and day to day. I just, you know, I've taken two departments, the technology department, the product department, and we've merged them. So a lot of my work right now is like solving the puzzles and the problems and the elephants that come out of bringing, you know, this, this large group of extremely talented and passionate people together, um, to do our work. You know, like one of, one of the elephants that I'm working on in in this space right now is, you know, what is the next evolution of MediaWiki as as software that we support? You know, and the first question that we've raised in that space is how how do we sustainably support our APIs going forward? So big big question. Many of you here I'm sure are familiar um, with that question, uh, but that that's like immediately on the table and. Um, I'm lucky enough to have like a really strong leadership team um, that has made a list of a lot of these elephants and they committed this year to start working through them. So they've picked like four. So you'll be hearing more from us about that like the, as we, as we um, go through the year uh, because this is actually one of the objective and key results that we published um, on Meta for, for this annual plan. Um, in terms of a missing piece of the puzzle, you know, um, I think for me, I, I, you know, I have, I have so many missing, <laughs> so many questions on my mind, so many open questions to answer. Um, one of them that I, you know, it was actually raised just a little bit earlier is like things like how do we move forward, you know, with the community wish list? Uh, like, there, there are a lot of other similar questions that have to do with how do we um, hear and then do something about all of the needs of the movement. 
you know, like, like how, do, how do we do that very consistently and, you know, live up to the promise of the organization and the product and tech space? So, so that, that question is, is underneath, I think, a lot of other, like, similar questions. And, and that's like a, you know, that's a puzzle that I'm going to probably be wrestling with the entire time that I'm here. Because we're just such a vast ecosystem of projects, of people, of languages, of the whole world. So, so how do we do that effectively, you know, um, within the limitations of the, the organization that we have? And I, I think we can do a lot. Um, I think we have an incredible community of volunteer um, contributors, technical, and uh, as well as, you know, every other kind of contributor. But, um, you know, figuring out how to harness that energy and apply it in, in the best ways, like that, that's like a, you know, it, it is a huge part of the work that, you know, that I think about every day. And I see a question. Oh, Guillaume. Hello. Hi. This question is for Selena. I was wondering if you can talk a bit Hi, about. Hi, Novum. Hey, you recognize me. I was wondering if you can talk a bit about the changes in the annual plan from last year to this year, specifically the product and technology part. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, there, there were, you know, I, I'll just like pick a couple things that were important to me. Um, you know, uh, this year we decided that we really wanted to engage with the community really early. So starting in February, we took a draft set of objectives and a description of our priorities, and we published those on Meta to try to start to have like a real engagement. Um, and we got a lot of feedback on it that helped us like take what our original ideas about where our priorities should be and where we should focus and evolve them, you know, over the course of several months. Um, and within those priorities, uh, something that was uh, that came out in the conversations that I was having my listening tour, the conversations with staff, um, as well as the feedback on our draft annual plan, was that we needed to devote some time um, and resources to working on the problems of the editors with extended rights. And where this came from was thinking about the types of software problems that we have and where there was like a really kind of large maintenance backlog. So, um, and also in within that, there was like the known um, maintenance backlog, but then like a lot of unknown things because there's a lot of really important uh, tools that editors with extended rights use, uh, functionaries, you know, stewards, um, you know, uh, folks with check user, you know, all, all, all those kinds of folks, they have all these tools and we don't always know actually like what the state of those tools are. So, so that's like a process that we're going through now to try to understand that more. So, so that, that was like a, you know, th those two things, just that really early community engagement and being responsive and thinking through and trying to find the best ways to get feedback. And then this, this focus on editors with extended rights. Um, and, you know, you'll be able to follow along. We're going to have like quarterly, um, you know, learning sessions where we report out on our progress like each quarter. And then we'll be using that to inform like how we do our process next year. Thank you. Is there any other questions? I yeah. have questions. I have a question. Have questions. Okay, okay. Um, first question, what songs, if any, are you all going to sing tomorrow night at the week karaoke? <laughs> and while you ponder about that. I think only one of us is actually committed to going, so I don't know that that's a fair question to everyone. <laughs> I said, if any. Um, the second question was for Selena. You've talked about technical contributions. Do you have any specific ideas about how to make it easier to um, tap into the larger technical community to make it easier to contribute to MediaWiki and tools? Yeah, sure. Your first first question. It was Heartbreaker by Pat Benatar is the song. Okay, it's a really good song. Um, and then to the second question, yeah, I, 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 you know, my first idea in this space really is, is what I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I think one thing about like the ideas that I have, I, I try to keep them like relatively simple and straightforward, you know, so that we actually um, are able to do what we say we're going to do. And my ideas around this, like start, start with the APIs, you know, so in terms of the things that I think that we can have the most impact simplifying and uh, making it easier to maintain all of the APIs that we have, like that's, that's like a, a critical thing. Um, I also think, you know, there's a bunch of work that 
uh, our teams that we're already doing around the hackathon, the technical um, contributor programs that we had. So just continuing with those and then learning, you know, as we uh, tackle these API problems that we have, um, just learning from that and iterating over time. So that, that, that's my idea. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, look, we have one here. We have a microphone for you. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Andrew. I represent one of the two uh, sister project proposals that have been proposed since 2019. And uh, we have been waiting for at least more than four years and it's been stuck in limbo uh, because and basically we have been punted around like a football. Uh, we were told that approach this group and then the other group was like, well, you should actually talk to the other group. And it is very likely that we will continue waiting for five, six, seven years. And currently we reside under Wikiversity, uh, kind of like as a placeholder before we, we could get the approval. So my question is, uh, would the foundation have like a roadmap for this kind of timely decision? Because honestly waiting for four years just for getting something approved, it's a very long time and enth enthusiastic volunteers that initially joined uh, their interests start to fizzle out if you if you don't get this kind of timely decision. And the second part is, uh, would there be kind of like a strategic support for up and coming projects such as this one? Thank you. So I think what I want to say is you're right. That is a long time. And this has been a priority that the board has identified and Yesterday, Selena and I both attended a meeting with our board uh, around the task force to really tackle the challenge that you've named. Let's be very clear what the roadmap is going to be. Let's be very clear what it's going to require in terms of approving projects or not approving projects because people want decisions is I think what I'm hearing you say. And so um, the good news is legitimately this is in motion. I wish I could say to you it was all solved and we had all the answers. It is in motion. Some of the trustees that are here in the room are the ones leading that initiative and that work with us. And so we can, in good conscience, answer the question, there is a roadmap being developed so that people, I think in fairness, don't have to wait years and years to get an answer. But I do think there's a lot of complexity in how to give people the best possible answer of what support can or cannot be provided. And that's what Selena and the team are working with that board task force to achieve. I don't know. If I, I think that's right. I, and to the to the other question, um, that there is an incubator program for new Wikipedia projects. Um, that's I think you know focus, focused on language incubation, um, but for broader sister projects, I, I'm I'm not aware of one. Okay, I have a question. Um, thank you so much. My name is Ruby from Ghana and I'm part of the Open Foundation West Africa community. Talking about the future of um, Wikimedia and looking at the world, how people are searching for information differently. We've seen tools like ChatGTP and a, a lot more similar tools that works like ChatGTP serving the world with information. I'm wondering if the Wikimedia Foundation is thinking about having a tool like that, that depends on Wikimedia projects because Wikimedia projects have a lot of data, information that can serve the world with credible, reliable information also for educational purposes. Are we looking at creating a tool like that that can serve people from the data that we have? Selena, I think that one's for you. Yeah, yeah, great question. Thank you, Ruby. Uh, so. Uh, this, this year, another aspect of the annual plan was prioritizing, thinking about what we're calling future audiences. So these are folks that may not be served by all of the existing tools or projects that we currently have, like what, what might be needed. You know, one of the ways that we hypothesize we can um, reach new audiences is maybe by finding ways of integrating and partnering with third parties. So, so that's one way. Um, but to your specific question about is there a tool that we could build? You know, I, you know, I maybe 
Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the challenge with any kind of thing that we might build that's specific to the space is we have to find the right like product market fit, basically. Um, so if, if we were to do that, we have to make sure that we're like, you know, reaching that audience that we're talking about. And I'm, I'm not sure today, but I do have a team that is working on this. Um, and, you know, they're trying to come up with different ideas to test them quickly, iterate on them. One of the things that they produced just in the last month was they, they published this chat GPT plugin. You know, it is, it is on in open AI's like infrastructure, but you know, it is, it is one of the ways in which we're testing out ideas like this. If we were to produce something like this with a user interface like that, you know, like, are, are we reaching that audience? So what you can expect um, from uh, that team over time is that we'll keep taking ideas like that and, and testing them. Some of that will be in our projects and in our, our environments, and some of them, you know, will not. And I think through that, we'll kind of, like, figure out, you know, what, what is the best, best way forward. Okay. Well, I, I think that wraps up the questions. I know Mariana has one more thing she wants to say before we, we So call I it think a night. the main thing I wanted to say is that we've been working really hard to ensure that foundation leadership are very accessible. And so I know we're on a stage, but we can all just chat as well. Selena and I and Lisa will be out uh, at the conference. I just wanted to introduce the rest of our senior team so that, again, if you have an opportunity uh, or have questions that you just approach folks directly um, and get answers to those questions. So maybe I'll say who they are and they can stand up. And just so you know, Jaime Gomez, who's our chief financial officer. Uh, if you wanna ask about how we spend our money, he's a good person to ask. Our general counsel, also uh, a long-term uh, member of the Wikimedia movement, Stephen Laporte. Stephen um, can help answer questions about regulatory or legal matters. Our chief communications officer, Anush Ali Khan, and Anusha's team is the one running Wikimania, and she's available. It's only day four, so I'll be gentle because our new um, chief talent and culture officer oversees our HR and people function is there Courtney Basharazin, so she is getting uh, inducted into the Wikimedia movement by being here, which is amazing. And so all of us are available. We're happy to talk directly, answer any questions that we can, and if we don't know the answers, at least do our best to try to point you in the right direction um, and get help. Yeah, I think on day four, Courtney still gets to ask you questions, so uh, that'll change soon. But uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who, who submitted questions. I want to thank everybody who, who came both online and, and here in person. I want to thank Selena and Mariana for all your thoughtful answers to the questions. And uh, as Mariana said, this is not, you know, we're, we're out of time here for this session, but uh, we are available to answer questions uh, for, the, for the, our remaining time here and, of course, always online. So, again, thank you. And, uh, We'll, we'll go on to have an amazing Wikimania in the, over the next couple days. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thank you to Mariana and Selena and Lisa. Um, just for everybody, we're trying to organize a big group attendee photo here at quarter to five. So stick around, we'll move you around. We'll hopefully get a really nice shot of everybody. So come back if you are moving for 4.45.